Hello and welcome to the Gooners podcast. Michael. <laughs> That's your typical on. entry. It's How was been dinner? A while. How was dinner? Um, it was good. It was good. Uh, I appreciate you rescuing me. <laughs> not not Mexican food, I hope. Um, you Since know, you spent the whole week in Mexico. Believe it or not, I had no Mexican when I was in Mexico. <laughs> but I suppose that? I had a taco. You may or may not have had a guacamole. <laughs> yeah. So, any problem getting back to the U.S. after uh, you know with immigration or anything like that? Now that I'm a since, full fledged citizen, I'm I'm allowed to just canter back in. Phil, he he uh, he he gained citizenship. He, he's actually English. I don't know if we told you that last mm-hmm. time. It's not a joke. Um, and gained citizenship just so that he could gallivant back and forth to Mexico all the time. And even though they're trying to stop him now, but. Uh, but anyway, let's <laughs> let's move off of Mexico and on to our wonderful guest, Phil. Uh, Phil Shane is making his return to the podcast. Uh, a couple years ago, you were on with us uh, right after we dismissed Man City from the FA Cup on our way to taking that uh, that title. He is the world's most preeminent play-by-play man for the sport we all love. Um, I'm not known for my exaggeration, so that is uh, you know that's legit. Calls all the top games for BN Sports for La Liga. Uh, which is Andy's favorite league in the world. Um, he also occasionally hosts the football show on Sirius F- XMFC here in the States. It is great to have you back, Phil. Thanks for joining us. Um, it is glad to be back. Um, I guess since he was going through a Mexit and we're now after an arson exit, um, <laughs> I'm glad to be back on board. Yep. And uh, in fact, <laughs> One of the stranger guests we've had, on, now he isn't strange, well, some people think he is, but the, the Speaker of the House of Commons, right in the middle of Brexit, joined us about a week, uh, a month ago. You realize he's a gooner, Phil. It's uh, good to have his priorities straight. Yes, and uh, right. and what he was doing on the air with us uh, during such an important time, I have no idea. It was more productive, uh, I'm sure. I would hope so. I would hope so. So you're fresh off of calling the Madrid Derby yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, last time, I think you joined us a day or two after having done an El Clasico. Maybe. Maybe it was a couple of hours afterwards, but I have to ask you, do you get whiplash when uh-huh. you follow something up like that with something like this? <laughs> In all honesty, no, because um, I think one of the things that's great about being sports and, and in all honesty, soccer almost everywhere, uh, there are certain people that might get into sports broadcasting just to kind of work their way up the pipeline. And I guarantee you that there's people that do this, that if they had the chance to do a Monday night football or uh, World Series or NBA on Christmas Day type stuff, they, they would jump at it. But I think the vast majority of people that end up doing soccer broadcasts are soccer fans. And soccer fans love to talk about the sport, no matter whether it's after a Classico or uh, whether it's after a <clears throat> victory against Huddersfield. So I, I guess we'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get to the, the Huddersfield game, the uh, let's get your feedback on how the season is going so far, because obviously a lot's changed since the last time we chatted. We've got a new manager. We've got the same ridiculous ingrate fans on Twitter and divisiveness on social media about our you know, current status. So, uh, so where do you land on both Unai Emery's first six months and just the overall performance of the team so far? Um, holding pattern to a point. I've liked Unai Emery since the first time I had a chance to watch him work back at Almeria, um, and nothing since then has changed my mind. Although the guy that I would have loved to have seen, I think we're starting to see why is uh, Hassan Hoodle up at uh, or down at Southampton, uh, and the miracle that he's working there. It's kind of, I guess, a more modest Jurgen Klopp style, which I think works well for for Premier League football. Unai Emery is a different bird. Sometimes birds like that don't fly, and we're seeing a little bit of that at Chelsea with Sadi, who I think is a genius, who Pep Guardiola thinks is a genius, um, and who Pep Guardiola just thrashed 6 nothing earlier today. So oh. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. With Unai Emery, I think we've seen that as well. Uh, I think on the whole, it's a big improvement. But if you want a challenge for the top four, and the last time we talked, that wasn't even good enough. If you want a challenge for the championship, more needs to be done. And right now, uh, I'm not going to blame. What's left is not blaming Wenger. It's not blaming Gazidis. It's not even really blaming the people. It's just realizing what the situation is, which is 
in their desperation, they made some decisions that in hindsight don't look that good. And it's not impossible to fix, but they are things that need to be addressed. And even in a positive standpoint, I mean, people are pointing to Mesut Ozil, uh, maybe a little bit of a, of a question mark about Mkhitaryan, but even the positive of Obama Young, some of these things need to be readdressed because you can't have one, two or three good players when you actually need 23. Cool. And mm -hmm. at this particular point, especially defensively, uh, there are just too many weakness for, weaknesses for this Arsenal team to legitimately challenge for a top four spot. Although as close as we are to a top four spot, it almost seems like a minor miracle. Well, it's one, this one point, one yeah. point, but, but it's a big point. Yeah, it is, and there's and there's a lot of cluster there as well that's gonna gonna kind of get in our way. But um, do you, I mean, do you see him being more of a uh, of a transitional manager to the next person, um, or do you think he is the next person I, with, with I think, the capability of of accomplishing what the goals are over the next couple of years? I think he is the next person more than Saudi is. Um, although I think when you look at Saudi. The situation at Chelsea is he's coming in with a specific style and used to dealing with players that have a specific mindset. Um, with Unai Emery, I think it's uh, there is a style and a tactic base to what he's trying to do, but I think it translates better. I, I think we've seen more consistent performances from Arsenal this year, uh, more aggressive performances than we're used to seeing in years past, more adjustments. Um, and I think the problem now is the fact that some of the competition in the Premier League is getting used to the adjustments that used to work for Emery. So now he's got to take it one step further. Uh, and again, it would be a heck of a lot some of the key players healthy. Uh, I think when you take a look at what he brings to the table, it's a winning experience, albeit perhaps in a, a different tier. Uh, you win the Europa, and that's still something to build on. You can challenge maybe with a with an undervalued side like a Sevilla, uh, but you still have to deal sometimes, and this is something I'm not exactly sure uh, he has adjusted to, and Arsenal's not there yet, but they want to get, uh, the situation that he had at PSG, where you have the superstars, you have the great players. Um, and I think there were signs that it could have worked but it didn't, and he's got to find a way to get across that hump eventually. Otherwise, maybe to be a long transition um, with a little longer honeymoon, but he won't be around in two or three years. Uh, he's got to kind of do what Jurgen Klopp did, which was instill the mentality, the culture, show the style and the system, what you're trying to do, and then be very specific in the pieces to the puzzle that you pick up. Um, and I, I kind of joked on Twitter, and this didn't. This kind of went over like a lead balloon in <laughs> Boonerland, but uh, that Dennis Suarez is how you say Yossi Benayoun in Spanish. <laughs> yes, I believe me, I got that. I loved it. And I think that actually might shortchange Yossi, who, who had done more in his career at that particular point and was a more proven player. I think Suarez is still living on potential and still living – on a Manchester City slash Barcelona resume. He's at an age right now. He's got to deliver. We haven't seen that yet. It's asking a lot in a game and a half or a game and a portion. Uh, I think he can contribute, but if they're asking him to be the savior, that's not it. If you want, and this was the same point, even to a slightly finer degree with an Obama Young and a Lacazette, but if you want to be a great team, you need great players. Uh, occasionally you can roll the dice. Occasionally you can take a gamble. Um, and I, I think really what we're seeing, like uh, Shakiri at, at Liverpool, uh, they're not building the team around him, but he's a very useful weapon when needed. Uh, and I think it's a weapon that can grow. Uh, but you need to then go out and get the right pieces to the puzzle that he can then come in and be an alternate for. I think Suarez has the potential to be an alternate but we still don't have all the pieces to the puzzle yet. And in, in many ways, uh, the closest we came is when Alexis Sanchez was still on this team. And it was a very fragile situation. It was not handled well. And I still don't think we've recovered. I, I think there's players like Awobi who show promise, but he's being thrown in way too early. 
uh, and, and starting to prove some vulnerability. You have guys like Mkhitaryan who are being paid like superstars when he's probably a good playmaker. And then you have guys like Mesut Ozil who I, I guess I love him. I've, I've loved him since he was at Schalke, but at this point just wants to be paid like about a half a million dollars a week to play Fortnite. And that's not going to work if you want to if you want to be a Champions League team. My son spends that much money playing for it. I don't know how, how he makes that much money doing it. My son's in the other room probably doing the same thing. So <laughs> Yeah, I've actually commandeered the basement from him, so he wasn't able to play tonight. So let's get oh, to Huddersfield. I, I, well, I want to ask Phil one question. He sure. I, Maybe I misheard him. Did you say you don't think Unai is going to be here in two or three seasons? No, I think Unai will be here. Okay. But if he wants to be here longer than two or three seasons, uh, they're going to need to see something. And for example... You know what's going to happen, not right away, but after a month or two, getting close to August, as the feeling of this transitional season settles and the expectations of the next season start to take off. If he finishes in sixth place, one point out of fourth situation that they have right now, you can say, man, they were one point out of a Champions League spot. And if Jose Mourinho would have stayed at Old Trafford for another week, we might have had a chance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now all of a sudden you get into late July and early August and people are going to be saying sixth place isn't good enough. And they're right. So what are you going to do? And he's got to he's got to convince people that he has the plan. And it's not even just him, though. And I think he's the he's the visual target right now for a lot of this wrath uh, because Arsene Wenger is gone. Ivan Gazidis is gone. No one even knows what Raul Sanyehi looks like. Uh, and I think, really, you take a look at the decision right now that's going on upstairs. I don't want to say to side with, but to basically hand the entirety of responsibility over to Sanyehi and to kick Mislintat to the side does not fill me with confidence. Because I know while Arsenal has the money, they don't have the the money. There's a big difference between uh, Bayern, Real, uh, and Barcelona, and Manchester United, and even Manchester City uh, and Chelsea to a point, depending upon what mood Abramovich is in, <laughs> and the money that Arsenal earns from filling up the Emirates. Mm -hmm. um, Kroenke is big enough. He basically has a ranch the size of many states in Texas. It would be nice if he spent some of that Saint, of that LA Rams money. Uh, but even then, that's not going to do it in the modern era. I think what needs to happen, and it's not really Billy Bean Moneyball, but you have to be able to take the technology that's available right now and use it to your advantage. And that's what Miss Lintot was able to do with two or three amazing signings. Um, I think now that they're being overused a little bit, Guys like Gendusi and Torreira, you're seeing a little bit of a weakness, and I think some people are ready to dismiss them already <laughs> without realizing how young they are um, and what they've shown to this point. And those are Miss Lintot guys. Um, Dennis Suarez, I think, is I remember him when he when I was back at Barcelona, he had a lot of potential. And I think that there's kind of room for both. You need the handshakes. You need the smoky room occasionally. But you also do need the guy that's been sweating over the tape and looking at the, at the numbers and trying to find the best possible buy for the least amount of money that would fit into the system that you're trying to, to go with. Now, I'm not exactly sure that's an Unai Emery system either, though. I mean, with Jurgen Klopp, he does kind of buy into that. I think Pep Guardiola does as well, and they have the money to basically just plunk it down when he does find a target. Um, I, I think Arsenal has need to be a little bit more creative. They have to this point, and I'm not satisfied with the explanations that I've heard as to why he will be leaving. Now, whether he goes to Bayern or not, whether he goes somewhere else or not, in my mind, this is an opportunity lost. Arsenal had a good guy. Now, for all I know, He's a jerk, and it's tearing up the front office. That, doesn't, that really doesn't uh, come out into the media at this particular point. I've read sometimes that he's a little difficult to deal with because he's so sold on his method and manner, and sometimes that ruffles some feathers. But you hired him because he was confident in his method. You've seen that that method can be successful, and just to, to cast him off after such a short period of time I think is a missed opportunity. I, I don't think it's going to be fatal, but I think – that they're throwing away something that they had that other teams did not. 
Well, and, and if reports are true, I mean, when Dortmund had new leadership walk through, he butt heads with them right away, and he was hired to to work with a completely different team of 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 leaders. And so, mm -hmm. I, I you know, I'm hoping that that's that's the true part, and that we are going to try and replace him with someone that can work a little bit better with our Spanish contingent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be an interesting summer. It really is. We're going to see a lot of exits. So we got to, like you had said about uh, Shakiri. I mean, he came from a, being a big fish in a small pond to a big pond where he's a bit fish. And he's filling that role well. And when he needs to, he gets called on and he does some business. Those are the type of players we need, Mike. You know? Because right now. Big, stocky football player looking guy. Uh, well, short like stocky, right? <laughs> oh, that's yeah. yeah. Now, so one other like, thing about Suarez, I don't want to just cast him off because this is something that, that Ray Hudson and I have talked about quite a bit. And it's changed a little bit in the past decade because the league has grown. And you take a look at all of the managers that are out there international. Um, you look at all of the players that have come over from La Liga. But when David Silva made the move, he was a good player in Spain. When Santi Casorla made the move, he was a good to a very good player in Spain. Um, Juan Mata, et cetera. Uh, I'm just, I, some of the names elude me, but that prototypical inside inside attacker slash central midfielder who has the ability to carry, to dribble, and to create. I'm not saying they're run of the mill, but there's a lot of them. They come over to England, and all of a sudden it's now that they have maybe someone playing alongside of them, someone playing up in front that fits a little bit better, all of a sudden something clicks. Or maybe it's uh, just a piece of the puzzle that the defenses that exist aren't quite ready for. Uh, and we've seen Silva arguably turn into one of the best players the Premier League has ever seen. Juan Mata, when he's not in the Mourinho doghouse, can kind of do the exact same thing. Casorla would have gone down as a legend if he hadn't been sidelined by injuries over the last two or three years. Uh, so there's the chance that the skill set that Denis Suarez has could translate well. And we saw that the first few years, even though he's not Spanish, it was one of the reasons he was successful there in Alexis Sanchez. We saw that initially until something happened, be it age, be it injury, be it uh, wandering eye, um, something happened, but it worked really well for a while. If they can find a way to harness that, I think that Suarez can be useful, but it's gonna take more than that. And especially in the back, if some of the reports I'm hearing about them trying to get rid of Mustafi, uh, I mean, Koscielny's not going to last forever. Um, I do know and one of the Michelin type guys is a very young, promising Greek defender, but that might be a lot asking him to step in right away. Uh, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that need to be filled. Suarez is maybe one piece, I guess similar in some ways to the Peter Cech that we talked about before. Great goalkeeper. We didn't really need him. Uh, it was, uh, in my mind, a an upgrade but not a gigantic upgrade where other areas needed a huge upgrade and were just ignored. And uh, now you look at Bernd Leno, who's a good to a very good uh, goalkeeper and getting the job done, but it's the guys in front. And then maybe that one, and I don't call it an enforcer, but the Vieira type that we've been missing for over a decade uh, that can tie everything together. You just need leadership. You need a spine. And even with Unai Emery and the flashes that we've seen to this point, that's not there yet. Yeah. Well, this summer will tell all. I think uh, you know we'll, we'll see whether the reports are true or not about the amount of money that's being spent. We'll see how it's spent. Uh, we, you know, we we'll see if he's going to try to recreate uh, a Sevilla or whether he's going to try to turn us into what Arsenal should be. Uh, wanted to send a, a, a shout out to the chat room. We've got uh, some people in here, even though it's a late night East Coast pod where where most of uh, our English listeners can't. Uh, can't be involved, but Mike Hernandez is in there. Looking forward to meeting him this week, actually. Uh, Rob Ford, Carrie McCollum's in there. I've uh, got a few people who uh, haven't seen in here before. Uh, welcome back, Archie, John Smith, Matthew Belcher. So uh, we're going to move on to the Huddersfield game. And uh, I believe, Andy, you have some questions or some uh, some feedback on that game. About Huddersfield? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we yeah. had to talk about the game. I mean, it was I know, the, the working title of the podcast is Mac because that's kind of how the game was uh, yeah. turned I out. Mean, but uh, we got to talk about it. 
Yeah, I think it was another lackluster performance, but it's three points. And after today's Chelsea's loss, I mean, we've moved up the table again because of the uh, goal difference. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like they're doing as much as they can to allow us to leapfrog them. Now we got to take advantage of it. But, Mike, this is our first away win since November. Oh, we did be black. That surprised me. That's not good enough for you. <laughs> no, but I, I actually had to look back to see if that was correct or not, and it was. I mean, we we uh, I think our last I can't even remember which which one it was. Our last win on the road was in in November, uh, away from home, and uh, it's the second time in three weeks that we've been sitting around on a Sunday and leapfrog Chelsea in the table. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. We well, we do better when we don't play. Like, we should just cancel the rest of the season and we'll finish third. I think. <laughs> That's our best strategy from here. Um, yeah, the game against Huddersfield, I mean, the, they had more shots than we did. They had more possession than they did. They had a higher passing completion. I mean, stats don't tell the whole game. More tackles, more corners. We had none. Uh, the only stat other than the final score that we exceeded them in was in times dispossessed, which I don't think is you're, you want to exceed them in. So, you know, they – some people, including uh, someone in our chat, have said they were the better team on the day. I don't know if they were the better team, but – uh, He's a town, Huddersfield Town fan. I, I mean, it, it just – it wasn't a great performance, but it was great enough to get three points, and really that is all that matters to me. Yeah, Phil, what do you think? Um, I agree with you in regards to the road woes, which kind of goes back to last year in Arsene Wenger. Uh, I think the start of the season until November, they were they weren't winning everything, but they were being competitive. Uh, they had their chances. Maybe a late blunder here or there uh, would have cost them, but it looked as though they turned the corner. Uh, there's still some work to be done. For example, one thing also that popped up today in the interview with Bernd Leno that Arsenal are the only team in the Premier League that does not have a shutout, a clean sheet on the road, and they had one. Uh, until the own goal in injury time here. So uh, statistics sometimes bending reality a little bit, but uh, the fact that they could not keep a clean sheet against a team that seems destined for relegation, the fact that they were limited uh, to two goals, partly due to lackadaisical play, partly due to selfishness, I think. Again, like I said, with Awobi being put into situations uh, where more is being asked of him and he's trying to do too much. Uh, I, I think if he would have been a little more uh, of a team player in this situation, there were maybe two or three other goals out there. But uh, you take a look at what could have been a handball earlier. You take a look at uh, what might have happened deeper in injury time after the first goal uh, for Huddersfield. This is a game Arsenal were lucky not to drop points in, if not drop all three even though there are arguments that they were they were better when it counted. So uh, I agree with you, three points, put it in the pocket. Uh, but I wouldn't take it as a huge positive. I'd take it as a warning that this could have easily gone the other way. And this was arguably the easiest road game they have the rest of the way. And if they could mm -hmm. barely squeak out a one-goal win, uh, that does not bode well. So now it's up to when I am ready to come up with a little something different. And again, hopefully find a way just to, to stay healthy, especially defensively. I just see that big missing piece of the puzzle up top. Uh, it could be a Mesut Ozil shaped hole, but he doesn't seem interested in filling it at the moment. Um, Mkhitaryan flashes. But the final product isn't there. Same for Awobi. Awobi given the benefit of the doubt because he's a little bit younger. Um, the same concern I had with Lacazette and Obama Young when they came over is while they do score, they need a lot of shots to score. And sometimes those shots just aren't there. Um, so it would be nice to get a poacher uh, that could maybe find a way to sneak in and play off of one of them. Uh, but does that mean you're going to have to get rid of one of them in order to bring a, a player of that caliber on board? So for the rest of this season, just try and stay healthy, compact, don't give up cheap goals on the road. And I think that you'll be in Europe. Um, and if you can find a few extra goals here or there, there's a chance you could pip back into that fourth spot because 
I'm not saying the bloom's going to be off and the honeymoon's going to be over uh, on on OGS anytime soon, but they weren't as bad as they were at the beginning of the season under Mourinho. United aren't as good as they appear to be now over this 10-game stretch for Solskjaer. So basically for Arsenal, they need to be in position to take advantage yeah. when a point or three are dropped down the stretch. And the fact that they're still in striking distance is a good sign. But I guess going back to our conversation two years ago, finishing in the top four is not good enough if you want to be the team that Arsenal should be. Um, I think – Battling with Spurs for third is probably a closer reality at the moment, but it's going to take some serious investment um, in time and mainly effort uh, if you're going to challenge the top two because they have a clearly defined uh, style, a clearly defined culture, and they have rosters full of players that fit what they're trying to do. And Arsenal and pretty much the other 18 teams in, in the EPL do not. Mm. Yeah. This is going to seem like a non sequitur, but just a, a rapid fire question for you. Uh, does pineapple belong on a pizza? Yes or no? <laughs> There's a reason yeah, yeah, we're asking this. I used to work in a pizza joint um, <laughs> when I was in college, and I never thought so. But with ham or especially Canadian bacon, it goes down really good. So I don't know if you want to call oh, okay. it. You don't have to call it a pizza. You made know. somebody very happy in our chat, by the way. Thank you. So, but Thank you. also, I for me, okay, this is another one. I love Chicago deep dish. That's not pizza. It's got to be New York. you got to be able to fold it like a sandwich or something <laughs> in your hand. Even better if you pick it up off the street. I don't mean like on the street. But, um, but for me, pineapple, I can give it a go. But I, I know what you mean. For me, a typical slice, just give me sausage, pepperoni, and I'll try not to wear most of it. I'll try and, and eat just at least a little bit of it. Well, you've made, that, was good, that was a good non sequitur. You've, you've, well, you've made, made David Ziegler one, made yeah. one person happy. Um, <laughs> so, you know who made me happy, Mike, was, uh, and I don't say this often, was Mr. Awobi. He broke the deadlock, 16th minute. Um, I think we deserved the lead at that point. Uh, he volleyed a, a, a Kalashnikov cross. Uh, took a slight deflection. I'm more impressed with the, the his ability to actually connect with the cross. It's extremely hard to do at that speed. Um, but yeah, it, it's nice to see Wobi get on the score sheet because uh, he gets a lot of stick from the fans. Um, I, I think he got booed, didn't he? Well, there's certainly been discussion in the chat box about whether he was booed or whether the sub. I think the, sub, the, the act booed. of him being subbed was booed, it, not him being booed. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a debate to be had about that, but it's it, either way, it's absolutely ridiculous. But well, uh, there were two or three other chances after uh -huh. the goal where he broke in, had help in the one was Mkhitaryan, the other might have been Lacazette, where uh, he had the I would say it was an easy pass, but if he was thinking pass, it would not have been that difficult. Instead, he just whacks it first time into the side netting outside the post. Um, and that almost came back to to cost them. So I, I agree with you. It was it was a nice finish. It was a brave finish, and he's young enough that you can excuse him for some of these things. But uh, it takes eleven guys to win the game, not just one. So I guess the quicker he learns that, the better he's going to be. Yeah, I like I like the fact that he that he went for the audacious you know first yeah. time because you you really do have to watch it all the way in. You got to get your body. I mean, it is so easy. For that to go awfully wrong and frankly you call it a slight deflection i am not convinced that it wouldn't have gone out for a throw-in if it hadn't oh, been totally. deflected. but it was still um, slight <laughs> but uh, you know that that said he didn't exactly cover himself in glory with his finishing overall yesterday i mean and he also didn't cover himself in glory with his goal celebration no it so, was like a poor man's lingard crossed with sturridge and that is not meant as a compliment no i don't no, know what the that whole, was that well, both goal celebrations were starting to look like uh, it's very Spursy, and I don't appreciate it. So, Mike, I back the knee slide. Yeah, Huddersfield had a fair penalty shout when Kashoni blocked a punch and shot. I know outside of Arsenal, punching is your favorite footballer <laughs> on the planet. So, was he robbed? What were your thoughts here? 
I mean, first of all, when you leave the pitch during a game to go drop a deuce, and then the next time you score, you wipe yourself with the corner flag, you automatically become my favorite non-Arsenal <laughs> player, and that is is Sir Jason Punchett. Um, and yeah, it, it, it hits Koscielny on the hand. Um, you could argue that it was, you know, ball to hand. Um, you could argue that his arms were at his side, but they were kind of bent, and there is you can clearly see that the, you know, the ball is headed towards the goal and it goes off of his arm and right into his crotch. And, um, you know, I would not have felt aggrieved if that was given as a penalty, but uh, fortunately we, uh, we had a little luck on our side. When it comes to class, or when it comes to Koscielny, we tend to have a lot of luck when it comes to handballs. We do. Now, Phil, you call games every week. Would you have, what's your thought on that penalty shout? Same thing I mentioned earlier. I think it was a it was a clear penalty. Yeah. Um, although in La Liga, even with VAR, there have been some ones that appear to be clear penalties. Uh, so I think a lot of the people that are looking at VAR popping into the Premier League next year and resolving all controversy are just <laughs> fooling themselves. Uh, it still sometimes seems to favor the bigger teams, basically giving the ref two calls to get it right. Um, I'd say the, the first couple of months of the season were a lot fairer in the fact that the, it could have gone either way. I, I think maybe in the effort to kind of speed things up, uh, they're not reviewing things as much. But again, I've seen things like that called as a penalty on review, waved off as a penalty because like you're saying, ball to hand or just the, the range was too close. But it was one of those situations that I think Arsenal got a little lucky. Yeah. Well, it was ball to hand to balls. Uh, <laughs> John, John in the chat. Oh, by the, by the way, there were two things, and you guys probably caught them being uh, as Twitter degenerate as I am. Uh, the two clips that made it that made their way out from uh, international games this past week. You hear the one for I think it was Argentina where the guy started making like the the uh, Formula One noise as the guy's racing downfield. <laughs> <laughs> that I had not seen. Look for that one. I, and then there was another one from India. Where the that ball one gets, I've seen. <laughs> the ball gets whipped in, and the guy, the defender, slides to knock it out and then slides right into the post. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he, he knocked one ball clear but gave up two. So. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that one I've definitely seen. And, and uh, no, But we'll look for the other one on there. Um, yeah, I like uh, John Smith saying that he uh, in the chat room saying that he faked the the uh, the injury, if you will, just to to cover himself from that Julie handballing. Worked for Sergio Ramos all the time, so it, it does. It, it does. I'd like to I'd like to give him a real injury there, but so speaking of two balls, Lacazette makes it two nil. <laughs> uh, trying to segue, um, and Mike, I. We, we make it 2-0 against the run of play, and, and I think it's the best time to score going into half. Um, he turned home a Mainsley cross at the back post. It's a clinical finish, but the match was just boring. Yeah, I mean, a clinical finish, great lead up. It starts with Kishelny, uh, who recovered, uh, apparently, uh, enough to get the ball out to Iwobi. Iwobi to Mkhitaryan, slip, and, and Mkhitaryan almost slipped up. The whole thing was almost over because he slips up when he encounters oh, Christopher does, Schindler. Yeah. But, uh, but he recovered nicely to get it to Mainsley in a dangerous position. And for once, we finish off the half with a goal instead of allowing it. yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we've conceded, well, and we ended up doing it at the end of the game, but we've conceded, like, what did I say last week, 12 times or something like that in the Premier yeah, League at the end of the half? Way too many. Way in too the many. last couple minutes. And um, I, I have to really just, I mean, the one thing that I wasn't thrilled about with Lacazette in this game is that he didn't go for the knee slide. This time, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for a knee slide, and and um, and in that That's celebration, what would you say? No, it's because because they got these stupid celebrations now. Yeah, I don't understand what that is. But Guendouzi, by the way, never met a group of men that he didn't want to hug. <laughs> like, I mean, seriously. his wing, his wingspan is so huge, he can like literally fit his arm around a pack of nine men. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Love so. Him. One of the one of the key players, I think, yesterday was Leno. I think he made a few important saves throughout the match where it could have been very nervy for us. Um, that shot where he kind of parried it in front of goal that Kashani cleared, I think he saw it last moment or the, the ball looked to be swerving. But um, I thought he had a really good performance yesterday, Mike. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, they're all important moments when the ball's hurtling towards the back of the net um, and you have to get in the way. But, I mean, he was good. He he probably deserved the clean sheet. Uh, I, I, I'm annoyed he didn't get it, annoyed for him that he didn't get it. But, uh, you know, workmanlike game. He's. I don't think we really are in a position like we were a month or two or three ago where we had to, you know, argue about whether he was the rightful number one or not. I mean, he clearly is at this point. Occasional mistakes aside, he's, uh, I mean, he's at least as good as, 75 million uh, pound Keppa. Yeah. Keppa ball out of the goal today. No. Phil, do you think if, if Czech saw himself in the hunt for the number one keeper spot, he wouldn't have retired? Or do you think the writing was on the wall? He's just getting too old. I think if he thought he still had the chance, he would stick around. Mm. And I actually do think Arsenal and Unai Emery handled it well because they brought in Bert Leno, not for a huge amount, but a significant amount to the point where you knew that Leno uh, was at worst going to challenge for the number one shirt. But at the start of the season, they bowed to Czech's accomplishments and uh, the significance that he has in his Premier League history and basically let him play until he kind of played his way out, either due to injury or significant mistakes. Um, he's not comfortable moving side to side. He's not comfortable playing with his feet. He's not comfortable charging out. Now, these are all things I think if he was a younger goalkeeper, he probably could have adapted to. But at this stage, it's an old dog, new tricks type situation. Um, and I think Burt Leno was going to be the starting goalkeeper for Arsenal. The, the question was going to be when. The fact that it happened so early kind of leads check to the decision or to the choice, does he go somewhere else again or does he just hang it up at this particular point? And, I mean, you, you take a look at what's going on with some of the other older goalkeepers. Um, England's number one is now plying his trade at some of the lesser lights, uh, while Gigi Buffon is still at PSG and maybe signing on for another year or two. Uh, it's almost like uh, watching the Rolling Stones on their 40th anniversary or 50th anniversary tour. Oh, but Benjamin. people are still willing to pay to see him. Um, and I think people would still be willing to pay Peter Cech. I think if you put him in the right situation, he would still do well. I think if he, if you put him in Italy um, to a point where you have a more disciplined defense uh, in front of him, playing in a tactical situation like that, where he did not have to make the superhuman save uh, or the super athletic save, shall we say, where he could just play with his brain and that would be good enough most of the time. I think he'd be quite well, uh, do quite well. But he sees this as the point where rather than just uh, fading off into the sunset or becoming a shadow of the keeper that he was uh, to go out on still a relative high. And I, I think props to him. The one caution I would always say is in 10 years, they're not going to even be thinking about asking him to play anymore. So there's always an argument, wait until they drag you off and don't ask you to play anymore before you hang up the cleats. Um, but that's always up to the player. And I hope he doesn't regret it. He's brought some, I was going to say some great memories, but maybe some bad memories from an Arsenal perspective uh, <laughs> back in his heyday. Um, and he actually did have some significant moments as well uh, wearing the Arsenal colors. So it was the right choice. I think it was handled well. I think he had a decision to make, uh, and we have to respect that. Yeah, yeah no, I, and I, I think I heard somewhere, and it might have just been a rumor that he's already part of the Chelsea setup for goalkeeping coach next season. Mm. So. You know, I, I mean, it makes sense for well, him to go back there, right? Be the manager next year, exactly. So. Oh my goodness, that's a that's a conversation for another day, Mike. A, a lot has has been said about how poor our back line has been all season. Yesterday, I thought they were decent. I mean, Nacho had that goal line clearance, Kashoni with the clearance after the Leno deflection, Mustafi didn't fall over, um, <laughs> which at this point is a positive. I mean, it's nice to see them not running around like headless chickens, and they actually. She looked organized in uniform for a lot of the game. And considering Huddersfield were all over us for pretty much the last, you know, 25 minutes of that match, 
it, it's an improvement. You have to say it's an improvement. I mean, it was one of our better games defensively. Uh, I, I have very little to complain about. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> we were playing a team whose offense is offensive. I mean, as much as they were all over us and they outshot us and everything like that, I mean, they've scored 14 goals in 26 games, and two of them were own goals, uh, oh. including including yesterday. I mean, I think Darby had the lowest amount of, own, of, of goals scored in a Premier League season with 20, like 10 years ago when they were just – truly truly awful and i'm not sure huddersfield gets to 20. um oh. their their top scorer is matthias jorgensen with three goals oh. their second top scorer is own goal <laughs> <laughs> so i mean like we have 18 players that have scored this season they have eight and you know who even made that list andy you know who's on the list tell me schindler schindler <laughs> um so i mean we if, if uh if we could not have had a, back, a backline uh, performance uh, yesterday that was better than most against that team, then we, you know, we would have really had to start asking each other questions. And Mustafi, despite not falling down or sliding or anything like that, he still managed a couple of boneheaded decisions. I mean, he, you don't head the ball into danger, and he apparently learned how to do that from Licksteiner and uh, whatever. So, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it should have been a it should have been a clean sheet, but uh, but it wasn't because. Yeah. Because what happened inevitably at the end. Yeah, yeah, always, always. So it was another performance that was largely dominated by the host. But Mike, or excuse me, Phil, a lot of Twitter experts say that we need to, Arsenal need to find an identity. I think Unai said after the match, hey, you know, we're struggling to find the identity. What do you think we're missing that's going to create this identity that we're, that we're, we keep hearing about? the player to build the team around. Um, you look at Liverpool, and admittedly much of that is through the Gagan press, uh, and it's built around the iconic Klopp, but you still have Mo Salah as the target. Um, mm -hmm. You look at, at Manchester City, and there's so many weapons there, um, and some great players all over the park but they seem to be the most dangerous when De Bruyne is healthy and running the show. Um, and I'd still say Silva probably carries some of that identity, but De Bruyne has kind of stepped up and, and a younger person that can handle the load. Uh, Arsenal has been missing that type of character. In fact, if anything, that character uh, was discouraged from emerging over the last decade or so. Uh, so there's no real surprise that there's none that's popping up inside. But uh, again, you you need to kind of find players more like a Koscielny on the defensive side because he only probably has another couple of years left at most. Uh, but then you still need the guy that can be the driving force in the middle. And, and I think we have a lot of supporting characters on this team, a lot of players that could be benefit from and uh, take advantage of having uh, a personality that's out there. I think that's something that really say for Manchester United, now that Mourinho has gone, Pogba is starting to step up into uh, the ability to, to, to try and drive. Now, yeah. as to whether, whether that's just fool's gold and will eventually kind of fade away, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I saw him when I had the chance to call him when he was back with Juventus and I thought he was I don't say overrated. I just thought there was a lot of potential, but a lot of the shortcomings were not exposed because of the talent that was around him there. I think we're starting to see him mature a little bit, uh, at least on the field. I, I think we need someone like that. I think, again, you look in the midfield, that's really where it, it needs to come. Um, and I think Torreira and Gendusi can play a role, even Granit Xhaka. Uh, seems to have taken a step forward this year when many were, were willing to cast him off. Um, and again, for me, it's just that number 10, if that, if it's going to be a, a player in this mix, I don't really see Lacazette and Obama Young in the long term being beneficial because I think it takes away uh, the person that can, tr can drive the ship. And at this particular point, the only pilot we have doesn't really want to go out out of port. 
So that might need to be something that's addressed in the off season, but you need someone that has the character, uh, the willingness to take the, the leadership role, the willingness after a loss to step in front of the microphones and uh, accept whatever blame there might be, and then turn around the, the next weekend in practice or the next week in practice um, and let his teammates know what's expected of them. And I, I just think that this is, there's a little too much timidity on the offensive side or maybe a laissez-faire. Uh, if it happens, it happens. Um, I want to see someone, like Kashelny sometimes gets angry when things start to fall apart in the back. I'm not sure if if his teammates know really what to do correctly at this point sometimes, but I want someone that can get the attention of some of these talented, highly paid attacking players and get them to focus because I think, and you talked about what happens in the last couple of minutes of the first half, the last couple of minutes of the second half, all of that is concentration and professionalism um, and preparation also. So some of the blame goes to the coaches, but I think really once the whistle blows, it's the 22 guys that are in between the chalk that matter and they need to find someone uh, on the offensive side that will keep people accountable. Uh, and that person then also needs to be able to keep themselves accountable and, and fulfill their responsibilities. I don't see anyone on this uh, roster that is capable of doing that at the moment or seems willing to. Yeah, and, and there's a little bit more of that, I think, than we've had, in, especially in years past. Uh, Andy, you've always been crying out for for someone to take take charge and and uh, you know, bark at the at his teammates to to make sure that they were in line. It's you know, there's got to be somebody that people are are respectful well, of off the pitch and scared of on the pitch. But I think if you look at the last you know few years of of le- teams that have won the league, Vincent Company comes to mind. John Terry comes to mind. Um, Jamie Vardy think, comes to mind. <laughs> well. You know, Michael Carrick comes to mind. These players are the ones who don't shy away from being that voice and that leader. And so I, I just – we don't have it. And, and I remember saying last year on the pod, there was a moment where someone messed up in front of Kashalny, the ball went in the back of the net, and he just turned around and didn't say a, a, a word. And as mm-hmm. we said last week with Kevin Campbell, if he had done that, Tony Adams would have had a fist up his backside immediately telling him what he did wrong. And, and we've lacked it for so long. And I'm not sure we've really had it since Vieira left. And, I, and, you know, we hear that all the time, that we haven't had that captain. But none of our captains have. Arteta wasn't that kind of a captain. Koscielny's never been that type of a captain. Um, and honestly, Mike, I think the only person who would put the armband on today that would do it is Xhaka. I don't think he gives two shits what his teammates think of him. I think he would be willing to go over and give someone a, a hand, uh, an earful. Um, <laughs> that's not yeah. where I thought you were going. With that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm like, that's not what we need on our team. Um, no, I, one, I think one, one, guy, be- one of the guys that I think has some potential as a leader by example, um, kind of in a very similar style, uh, the Machidano role uh, is Torreira. Mm. And I think just his personality the effort that he shows. And sometimes um, he tries a little too hard and maybe there's a mistake here or there, but he's got, he's got that exocet missile capability where it seems like it's a breakaway. Next thing you know, he's tackling it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think from an example standpoint, but he's not even that vocal vocal. Maybe it's an age situation, a respect situation where he, he's not going to go up and shout. I've seen a little bit of it from Koscielny, although you do raise a good point. and, And in comparison some of those teams going back before Vieira. Um, I mean, you had Vieira, you had Petit behind him. You had if Adams. If it wasn't Adams, it was Winterburn. Uh, Lee Dixon would, would be yapping away on, on one side. They held each other accountable. And I don't want to pile on Arsene Wenger, but again, Arsene Wenger wanted everything to be focused on him in some ways, that it was his style, his team. Don't lose your cool. Uh, just stay out there, play your game. And I think in some ways that, that kind of uh, continues at this point, as you might expect. You, you, we didn't change uh, 23 players. We changed one man yeah. uh, or three or four yeah. here or there. So it's going to take a little bit of time. I wish they could have done something in the winter, uh, a little bit more telling. It'll be really interesting to see what happens in the summer because uh, – 
40 mil is not going to buy much. So they're going to need to shed. Who do they shed and how do they reinvest that? Um, I do think, and I know that the Arsenal faithful are a little frustrated with Kroenke, but the fact that his son has taken in a, a little bit more of a hands-on responsibility, the fact that in, in many ways he's celebrating uh, what Branch Rickey used to call the best possible scenario, which was you make it to the championship and lose. So that way you get all the benefit, but you don't have to give anyone a raise. So he has all this money going on and he saw what could happen with the Rams. Maybe, just maybe, if they find the right buy or two, they could convince him to open up the wallet a little bit. Because I don't really think Arsenal's that far away uh, if they find the right player or two. The supporting cast is there. I think Unai Emery is the type of manager that can get the most out of them. Um, but if so not, they're, they're gonna they're gonna spend more than forty five million this summer. I do not believe that that mm -hmm. I'm not even gonna go into the names. I'm gonna I want to call yeah. this guy, but don't don't believe that. I've done the math. I've done the math. John mm -hmm. Cross did not do the math. I've done the math. I sat up one night with a couple of bottles of wine and a spreadsheet, and I did the math. So believe me, it's it's going to be closer to what uh, what Ornstein's number was, I think, uh, which is a hundred than than the forty five and. But at the you same know. point, 100 doesn't buy as much as it used to anymore. It, it could buy one player or or less. So uh, Arsenal needs to find a way to – and, again, I think they can improve by getting rid of the right players for the right amount of money if there's a willing buyer. Uh, but they really need to find two or three key players that they can build this team around. And I think it could almost turn around overnight. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. It could, and, and there's a good shout in the chat room, getting back to the question about future captains for Socrates. Uh, he might be a little yep. bit uh, old to, to put into that spot, but as far as, you know, the, the one who commands respect and, and holds people accountable, we the point was made a couple of weeks ago was a good one. That one other have, one also, and I think we, we haven't seen his personality pop out yet, and he was victimized this past week, and I think a little bit unfairly, but he tries, for lack of a better word, he tries stuff. And he's solid enough defensively that if you put him in the right position, be it the outside left in a three back uh, or an attacking wing back in a four back, and that's Kolasinac. And yeah, I, I think sure. I think he does have the potential <coughs> personality to step up. I'm not saying necessarily a captain, but he can be a leader on the field. And again, that we're seeing signs of the combination with Awobi. Uh, I want to see a little bit more at the payoff end of that. But I think he is a guy that can really grow in. And a lot of people uh, were saying Saeed who. Um, I think that's now gone. And I think that's also allowed Montreal to slide to the inside uh, and maybe extend his career just a little bit. So I think he might be one of those guys that could provide a little bit of leadership. But you need, you need that big guy in the middle, be it uh, as a central mid or a center half. Uh, and... That's not really there yet. Yeah, my, my love for Kolasinac only grew in this game, even with him. Uh, I mean, I will take any day of the week, I will take a nonsensical own goal that doesn't end up costing us any points. If it's guaranteed to come with the whole not letting go of the ball shithousery thing that he did, where, <laughs> where I mean, he got punched. He got put in a full-on half Nelson chokehold by the guy. He got stabbed in the hip uh, with a knife. I mean, it was just ridiculous, <laughs> the abuse that he took. But uh, I love it. And and I own a pair. I, I'm just going on. I have to say for full disclosure, I own a pair of his practice-worn shorts. Um, so I, I am a Kolasinac fan. I just I, I don't want him playing left back in the back four. That that he clearly is not uh, capable of doing. But he could you know, he, he could be a leader if he, if he can find his spot on the team, which might just be as an all-out left winger. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take it. So uh, that's the that's the game. It's uh, the 26th game of the Premier League season. There's 12 left. It's going to be a, a, an interesting run in, but a uh, couple of general points that we have. And, and, and I've made reference to the John Cross article, um, which sent the Arsenal Twitter idiots, of which I count myself as one. So I'm not like just being, you know, rude to other people. I'm being rude to myself as well. I know Andy has his thoughts on the journalist and the article specifically, but, you know, and, and if, you know, being in, in the media, uh, being a, a, you know, a student of journalism as you are, um, 
if you don't want to answer this question, fine. But A, do you believe the information is factual? And B, if not, uh, or whether you do or not, why are we just as a fan base so gullible and triggered by stuff like this? I don't think we're alone, and I don't think it's just sports fans. I mean, all you have to do is just flip on political, yeah. flip on <laughs> CNN or Fox or MSNBC, whatever your flavor is, and within five minutes you're going to want to jump out the window. So uh, I think he got some information whether someone was feeding him that information for a different purpose. I don't think he just pulled the number out of thin air. Someone gave him something to lead, lead him to believe that that was there. And maybe for the shock value, he gave it a little bit more weight. Um, I'd like to think that he actually found a way to double check that, but I don't know how you really would if it was just a leak. Uh, I mean, how do you know what your transfer budget is before you know where you're finishing in the in the in the well, Premier League? Because, before you, in, in some ways, you're right, but you kind of you kind of know your minimum. In some ways, you got to remember two thirds of that tra uh, two thirds of the TV money is already kind of determined where you slot, how many times you're broadcast, mm -hmm. and really the the rest kind of just slides as to where you finish on the scale, which I think is one of the most amazing mechanisms that's ever been invented when it comes to competitive sports, because it does, it's not quite revenue sharing uh, to the point where you can tank it and still get a full share. You're still rewarded for, for what you do, but at the same point, uh, you're not penalized if you're a Huddersfield and you just don't have that gigantic budget. You still have the money and now how do you spend it to stay alive? So hopefully you can make even more money next year. Um, I, I think that they, they have a general idea of what the base number is. Now, the number you're talking about, uh, if they finish seventh or eighth, does it automatically still go to 100 mil or more? Or might the pockets dry up just a little bit? Well, it depends on how anxious they are to get back uh, rather than just re reconfigure the ins and outs financially. But the one, one of the things I've learned in my recent uh, self, self-taught uh, schooling on Arsenal finances in the last month or two is that, you know, the, the outflows for players are, you know, wages and amortized transfer budget. So if you get, if you buy a guy on a five-year contract, you divide the purchase price by five years, and that's what's added to the wage bill. So, it's, I mean, any discussion about a, a transfer fee amount without having anything to do with, you know, what that represents on an annual basis, the wages that that person is going to be earning, I just think is automatically BS. Because well, Let me ask you this, since you hopefully it was a good bottle of wine. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, you're right to the point where soccer is almost heading to the NBA joke that is trading players who will never see the court just for cap space or the fact that their contract is about to expire. Yeah. Um, but My hometown team is doing that right now. <laughs> but what I heard in regards to the handcuffing for Arsenal, and again, this has nothing to do with the $40 million transfer fee. You're absolutely right about that. But maybe if you're kind of slotting the type of salaries that would go along with that, is the fact that so much money in that salary wage bill, so much lost money is being tied up by three players of whom only one is even coming close to paying off what he's earning, that there's a danger of them getting close to some of the financial fair play triggers if they brought in a player that brought in that was getting paid that much money as well. Well, that's what was going on in January, but in in June it changes because of the new commercial money coming in uh, mm -hmm. from the from the Adidas from the Adidas and uh, and the new Emirates deal, which I think is why they were looking at only loan players, and why it it literally there's nothing more in the world that bothers me more than people complaining about Kroenke not spending his own money uh, because he couldn't buy players even if he wanted if he just went out and bought Lionel Messi. There's no play there, we could not afford to do that unless we got rid of like eight other people, but. You know that the payroll is a, is is a is a figure. It's an annual amount that includes transfer fees. It includes, I think, agent and imaging fees. It includes uh, the uh, the things that we know about the the one eighty a week, the the two hundred a week. You know, the Mkhitaryan salaries and the three fifty a week for Ozil, which did not come with a transfer fee. 
So frankly, it's not all that different than, than the money that we spend on someone that we bought just this summer. Uh, but uh, I, I think there'll be plenty of money to go around. If, if they don't spend it, then there's going to be some questions to answer because it's not like we don't need players. It's not like what Arsene Wenger said when we bought Czech, which is that there was no one available that was any better than anyone that we had, which we just know is ridiculous. No, and so, I think it'll be interesting to see how much say Unai Emery has. Um, for example, uh, just thinking of the of holding midfielders, uh, and there have been quite a few that have gone through Sevilla, uh, a couple that are still plying their trade or targets of PSG that he's quite familiar with. Someone uh, who, like, and I think he came in just after when I left, but someone like Avisam Ben Yedder, uh, who I think could be that player that could play behind a bigger forward uh, and, and sneak in and score. Uh, there are specific targets, I think, that could fit into an Unai Emery system. I just hope they're brave enough to do that because if not, um, they're just they're wasting the talents. And again, maybe Dennis Suarez was the best that they could do. I, I think Perisic would have been an improvement. Um, I think Carrasco could have been, but after watching him for two years at Atletico, I, I think he's all flash, um, no sizzle. So I, I, in some ways, I'm kind of glad that they did not get stuck. Although if it was a loan deal, it would be a good four-month uh, adventure. So hopefully Suarez can prove something. But uh, again, they need to, whatever money it is, get some incisive players. Yeah, and, and you know, again, I, I just, I, I, it seems like every summer has a different narrative. Like, oh, this summer will be huge because we are bringing in a new coach. And next summer is when we have to actually get rid of the people that aren't going to work in his system and find people that are, and we finally have money to spend. But this, you know, I'll, I'll say it for like the fifth consecutive year, this summer is going to tell us everything we need to know about where this team is headed. Um, and, and no matter how this year finishes off. So, um Maitland, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions in the chat. It was already on our list to talk about this whole Instagram saga with him. You know, again, I, we, we talk about Arsenal supporters. Maybe I should generalize and say football supporters or just the social media um, world that we live in right now. But basically, if anyone hasn't heard about it, um, he's getting skewered on, on his own Instagram page by quote-unquote fans who are – telling him he's lazy, he gives the ball away, blah, blah, blah. And he responds to every single one of them with a brief, you know, I'll try to do better. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. You know, and, and I don't know whether, uh, whether he was like legitimately trying to pacify people or whether he was kind of trolling them back by acting like he was ashamed that they 11 year olds and 40 year olds living in their, you know, living in their parents' basements and stuff were, were actually, you know, getting to him. But uh, either way, you know, when I Emery's first act when he came in was to ban fruit juice. I think he probably should have banned social media <laughs> because as, as much of an ass as I think this, these people are to, you know, to tag these people so that they see their comments, not just even talking about them, but talking about them to them. You know, do we really, should he be responding to that? You think? I don't think so, but he's a young kid, Mike. He came up through our Academy He's passionate about the club. He wants to play every week. He doesn't care what position. You know, it's got to be hard for a young kid to see those type, type of comments. But <clears throat> we're living in a world now, Mike, where, you know, you see Jaka two weeks ago get a, attacked at his car. You know, I mean, fair play to the guy for coming back at him and telling him to shut the hell up and, and – Fair but play. That, to never, that never ends well, though, for the player. Though, but it doesn't, doesn't matter, do though. Right no, yeah, no. But a lot of people came to the aid of Jaka. Even people who dislike him, that I know personally as a player, said, "Well, that's out of order," and I'm glad he said something. So, if Mainsley's trolling or if he's genuinely responding, I'm happy for him. But that's not where his he shouldn't be worrying about that. It should be his 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 time on the pitch. And let's be honest, Mike. I mean. There's a list of players in front of him that you would blame for some of our performances, and uh, he he's very high on that list, in my opinion, of players I would not be blaming. 
Yeah, well, I mean, he's, he's giving everything he has um, and, and playing positions that he's not supposed to be playing in. But it's just, you know, it, it just sucks to, to, to continually see that stuff from our fan base. So um, shout out to, uh, to everyone in the chat. Stan, the man is in there. Archie's in there. David Ziegler, uh, an accountant who is telling me uh, that amortization is not what I've described. I know <laughs> that amortization isn't straight line. Uh, I took it. I'm. I went to business school. I know that, but that's. I believe how the contracts are put on the wage bill. Wait, so, is it we're telling you that? Yes. He's, well, he's like, Mr. Finance. Pizza. He, you yeah, cannot he, he, trust a single thing a man who openly admits. And sorry, Phil, you did openly admit it, but you can't trust a single person who likes pineapple on pizza. I mean, I there, I could smell the pineapple in his comment. It was just the the breath, the pineapple breath was was as bad as anything else. And I'll, and I'll tell like that video. I found, someone uh, I saw it on Facebook where Phil it was the perfect way to eat a pineapple pizza, and it's a, a good looking pizza that someone's cutting up, then they just throw it in the garbage. And I was I thought that was the funniest thing. I will be with David next week. Actually, in like four days, I will almost guarantee that there's a pineapple pizza that he's going to try to eat and I'm going to try to throw away on Bourbon Street someplace <laughs> uh, in the next few days. That has to happen. Um, let's go to some user questions. Uh, we have some some great user questions from our regular listeners, some from people who uh, are, are chiming in for the first time. From Mike Hernandez, he's got two questions. One is for Phil. Uh, has El Clasico lost some excitement for foreign fans now that Ronaldo has left Madrid? What do you think? I think that it needs to, I don't say it needs to be rebranded. That's not exactly the right way because it always has been Real and Barca. And when they get together, uh, things happen. And in some ways, the Copa Classico meeting we just had last week uh, started well. And then I think both teams just kind of, because first leg of a two-legged cup uh, tie, they started to realize there was probably more to lose than there was to win. Uh, so it kind of got a little more cautious in the second half. The two games that are coming up, end of February, beginning of March, the second leg of the classic of the cup tie. And then the, uh, especially now that following Real's derby win and Barcelona's draw at San Mames, uh, the league match is going to follow in early March. Those are going to be more bare bones, dagger and teeth. Um, from a sizzle standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, it's Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, and I mean, he gets paid millions of dollars to stand around in his underwear. So you don't really need to do much more than that to get all of the publicity going. That's not there now on the Real Madrid side. I get, I get paid millions of dollars not to stand around in my underwear. <laughs> Especially with pineapples. Exactly. Um, but, but I think what we're starting to see bubble up is Vinicius. And it's not the Beckham, Ronaldo, beyond the sports page, that ability that they have to capture attention. But from a sports fan's, specifically a soccer fan's uh, potential, they want to see what this kid's going to do. And it's going to be a bit of a transition period because for the last seven years, it's been Messi versus Ronaldo, um, which is part of the danger. And I know Major League Baseball kind of went through this. The NBA has kind of gone through this, um, although that because of excessive free agency, I think they've come out the other side. But to the point where every single team, they tried to pick a superstar. The problem is that superstar in another year or two is going to be playing for another team. So now they're getting back to trying to sell the badge uh, and maybe uh, whatever star is of the moment is in the mix. But when you're talking about two of the greatest players of all time, it's hard not to focus in on them. And now that one of them is over at Juventus, not in, even in China, but he's actually still at another big European power, uh, it does pull a little of the attention away. However, I think all you have to do, like I said, is watch those two games coming up on BN Sports at the end of February, beginning of March, and you'll see that at least during the 90 minutes plus, uh, they still have what it takes to draw your attention. Yeah, I mean, the, that that was El Clasico before Messi and Ronaldo got there. It'll be El Clasico after, mm -hmm. um, you know, after both of them are gone. But, 
you know, it did, it just was like that incredible edge where you just felt like you were seeing constant one upsmanship oh, it was uh, for so many though, years. It's something that, that I think Slatan kind of mentioned himself a little bit and MLS is going through. Uh, there are a lot of Ronaldo fans out there. There are a lot of fans who, by the way, and this is again, part of the danger of Real Madrid, uh, that you generation, Gen Z type Real Madrid fans who now are Juventus fans all of a sudden for some reason um, because they're following the player. But uh, there is a little bit of that danger that's out there. Uh, but I think that in the long term, things will things will swing back and we'll see what happens. You can't, I mean, we're not that far removed, maybe three, four, five years at most from Lionel Messi moving on. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons Barcelona went out and got Neymar. Didn't really work, uh, although who knows if they get him back. Uh, so we'll see what happens as Barcelona tries to prepare to for, for Messi's eventual departure. Yeah, maybe two years ago, two years from now, three, four years from now, we'll be watching uh, Messi versus Ronaldo when, when the Miami-Los uh, Angeles Galaxy game occurs. No, 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 no. I was, <laughs> the point I was going to make, I'm glad you reminded me, is <laughs> – there's a lot of fans out there that root for Ronaldo. There's a lot of fans out there that root against Ronaldo because he kind of has that the villain Ooh. mentality. Same thing that Zlatan has as well. People, he's so good and he's so cocky about it. People want to see him fail. So sometimes people will tune in for that as well. That's not there. Uh, I mean, you can watch Gareth Bale trip over the ball going 100 miles an hour anytime. So, but there's something if it was Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, as far as the Miami one, I'm putting my money on this, by the way. I want to see if there's a house out there that would take a Messi, Ronaldo, Griezmann front line all for Inter Miami, because there might not be a city on Is Earth. Is that going to be their name, Inter Miami? Internacional de Miami. Oh, my um, God. There, there might not be another city on Earth that could bring those three players together other than Miami. So I'm still holding out hope that David Beckham's got their numbers on speed dial. Oh, you yeah. know he does. Yeah, I, I, I could think he could probably get them all on the phone. Second question from Mike Hernandez is for Andy. What kind of league does Phil commentate on? Are, are you going to go there? <laughs> Second best football league in the world, Mike. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> um, question from Rob Ford, who prefaces this as a serious user question because he needs to distinguish sometimes. Um, given the recent success of players like Nacho and managers like Pep and hopefully Unai Emery, is the current Premier League a good place for for Spanish players and and managers? Um, and you know, you you commented earlier about kind of on this topic about uh, David Silva coming over and improving about Aguero. But uh, I mean, do you see that that flow continuing and increasing of, of young Spanish players coming over here? It's where the money is. I mean, Arsenal even grabbed several of them before they were barely out of La Masia. It hasn't really worked out to this point for those players, but I, there will look where there's talent money will follow. We're seeing that even with, with American kids now. To this point, it's been going to Germany for the most part. But now that we're seeing some of those kids succeed in Germany, uh, the EPL has so much money they can afford to miss a gamble here or there. So they will try. And it's not just going to be trying to grab a, a Breck Shea or a Matt Miazga. I mean, they're going to look to try and grab like the next Alfonso Davies, the next Christian Pulisic, and cut out the middleman. So I think some of that's out there. As far as the Spanish thing, it's not just Spain, though. Um, and I think that's one of the intriguing things uh, when we're talking about the second best league on the planet, like the English Premier League is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you take a look at some of the talent that's managing now from a club to a pep, uh, Unai Emery, I put in there, Saudi, even though some Chelsea fans are probably regretting, I think he's a brilliant manager. Um, something's not working. And I think it probably goes more to certain people in the Chelsea hierarchy who were not fully convinced when they bought in. And some of that doubt has seeped into the dressing room, plus the fact that they're allowing Aiden Hazard to, to walk. Um, I think that's kind of tearing the team apart, but he's a talent. Hassan Hoodle's a talent. Um, Espirito Santo knows how to coach, and he's down uh, down a division. I, I think what we're seeing in England right now, since because of financial fair play, it's even with all the money they have to spend, it's tightened things up just a little bit. So where they have the freedom to spend the money is on the managers. And, and I think we've seen that 
more and more, and it's made the Premier League even better than I, it was before. You got time for a couple more user questions? Whatever you need. Okay, cool. Um, we got one from the Arsenal Way, at Frinton Gooner on Twitter. There are a number of players we expect to be released or sold at the end of the season. However, in the back of your mind, do you worry, given our transfer budget, which again presumes a few things there, uh, that we might have to sacrifice an Obama Yang or a Lacazette uh, to raise more money for transfers? In other words, are, are you know are we just... I mean, we're getting rid of so many players that our contracts are running out, basically getting nothing back for them. Are we going to have to sell somebody that we really don't want to sell in order to raise money for transfers? Does that concern you at all? I'll start with Andy Edge on this one. Um, and not really, no. Because as you said, Mike, again, we're not going to know the specific figure, but there's going to be money to spend. And as Ornstein had said, and, and I think as far as the English media go, he has more of an ear to the boardroom um, a hundred million is a decent kitty. And as Phil said, depending on which players you bring in, you know, that's either one player or maybe two or three decent players. We're not far away. And a lot so, of wages coming off the books. And too, a that's... lot of wages coming off the books. And so, um, I, I think if the hundred million is an accurate number, um, I think that, and, and again, think about players we might be selling. And if that pound for pound comes back into transfer, um, I think we're going to be okay. I don't think we're going to have to give up the likes of an Aubameyang or Lacazette. That being said, there is rumors that Aubameyang might be on his way out in the summer. So who knows? I haven't heard that. Uh, I, hope I would say if you had the choice, and I'm just going to blue sky this, um, Aiden Hazard or Pierre Emmerich, would you take it? Uh, yes. See, so again, everyone's fallen in love with with Oba and Lacazette. And in my mind, part of the problem right now, their best position is the same position. Mm -hmm. They're still useful if you play them, I don't know what they call it in England now, but uh, a target wing uh, to the point where it would be the trailing runner coming into the box, cross comes in from the other side, they're attacking as the defense follows the center forward through. They are useful playing out wide and coming inside. But that's still not their best position. And in some ways, it wastes 80% of the game by putting them in a position where they're, it's not their best. So if you had to sell one of those two players and you had confidence that you would have two starters out of it, I, I think Unai Emery would be wise to do that. But if it's a, a gamble, no, and you and I mean you don't really even have uh, a healthy backup at this point, so that would need to be something that would be addressed as well. I don't. I think it's gotten to the point where neither really wants to be a backup for the other. So how do you fit them in and give them both starters minutes? Um, so in some ways, it's a headache that could go away with a little restructuring of the roster. Uh, I would agree that there's a danger if you do that. Um, I mean, just take a look when they let Van Persie go, when they let uh, Sanchez go, even though they probably should have done it a little bit earlier, uh, it, those holes weren't really filled. So I, I think I want to make sure that they were getting someone that could lock themselves down and then maybe someone else that could at very worst be a 12th or 13th guy that could slide in. Uh, but it would not necessarily be a disaster if they had to sell one of those two guys off. Now, I, the main thing for me, though, is dead weight. And it, they need to find a way, even if it means playing uh, Maitland Niles or Nwobi or uh, any of the hyphenated kids that are making their way up through uh, the pipeline, to, to play them a little bit more than you would like. Uh, I think that will benefit Arsenal in the long haul than to basically have a guy who really doesn't want to be there and isn't going to give 100% effort. Uh, and we probably have a, a few too many of those. And I might even say I would have put Granit Xhaka in that list as well, except I think over the last, when he's been healthy, the last month and a half or two, he started to show signs of being the player that he looked like he was back in Basel. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't really seen here. 
and, and a big part of him is just staying composed. But guys like Anuzel, you got to resolve that. If you're going to go with Mkhitaryan, is that good enough to be a starter? And for the money that you're paying, um, the Obama Young Lacazette situation, you're talking about uh, Mustafa, even Socrates, uh, is that good enough? Is that great enough if you're going to be a top four team and really legitimately challenging a top two team? I get into arguments on Sirius a lot with our transfer guy, uh, Graham Bailey, who uh, kind of jokes about how many Arsenal players would start at Spurs. Um, the fact that he's a Middlesbrough fan, I can actually always just use that dagger on him. But in, in some ways, forget about Spurs. How many of these Arsenal players would start at City? How many of the Arsenal players would start at Liverpool? That's the yardstick that Arsenal needs to measure themselves against because that's who they're competing against. Yeah. You're going to end up with Mesut Ozil sipping a cup of tea uh, <laughs> after having that argument. But um, question uh, from Payush Kapoor. I, I think I'm going to read this more like a statement than a question because uh, I think we know the answer to it. When Emery interviewed for the job, do you think he mentioned to the board or interview panel that Ozil will not be in his future plans, knowing that Ozil had signed a new 350,000 pound a week contract. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that wasn't part of the interview. Uh, and no, I don't I, know I, necessarily I that he try, had that opinion at the end. I, I, I would agree with the latter part. If they did not ask him as to how he planned to use the roster that they had, someone should be fired. Well, um, he had all those dossiers, though. And uh, you, you saw how well, uh, was it, uh, huge binders full of, of people work for Mitt Romney. So uh, when you're talking about how to play with those players, I think he had an idea. But once the whistle blows, everything changes. And we have not seen enough. We've seen flashes of the messages that I think soccer fans fell in love with back in his Bundesliga days, back with the German national team, and back in the early days of Arsenal. We've seen flashes of that this year. But in, it's very similar, uh, okay, different scenario, but similar to what, what Isco was going on with Isco at Real Madrid. Um, and Isco is getting into a pissing match for the little amount of time that Santiago Solari is, is playing him without realizing in many ways he's responsible for that. He needs to be 100% ready. He needs to respond when he's given the opportunity. And if he makes a mistake on the field, he needs to be the one to try and address it. Um, and we have not seen that from Isco. Instead, we've seen him sulk. For Messit, um, if he really wants to be out there, there's four or five practices a week where he could show that. And you do that enough, sooner or later, the opportunity is going to get there. When you get the opportunity, you have to seize it. Um, so I, I think that there's no way Arsenal would have given when I Emery the job if they didn't ask him how he planned to use their, their most influential and key players. But in my mind, it's Messit who's probably failed the interview process, not Unai. Yeah, I mean, and, and the team is the star. Uh, so, you know, my, my point of view on uh, Mesut Ozil has been, been made and, uh, and I'm ready to move on. Um, as for the pod, we will also move on. We, had, uh, we got a lot of good questions in the chat. I'm sorry, we're pushing up, up on an hour and a half now. So we're going we're gonna to start to wrap up. A quick nod to Thursday, the next two Thursdays. Uh, without any Premier League games or FA Cup games, we have uh, our next two games against Bate Borisov in a round of 32. I mean, we're, we're not feeling particularly nervous about this one, are we? <laughs> I, I certainly hope not. Um, the teams in the competition, are there any teams that worry you beyond – I mean, I took a quick look today. Napoli, Inter Milan, Chelsea, Sevilla, maybe like an outside shot from like a Zenit or something because they get to play, you know, a home game every – every round and it's not easy to go there. Um, anybody else that you can think of that you're really that worried about in this competition? I'm not saying it's going to be easily won, but it just seems like there were maybe eight to 10 teams I had concerns about last year. And there's really only four or five this year. I, I would, I tend to agree. The fact that they were probably one of the two best coming through um, and of the teams that dropped down, maybe there's two or three more that would challenge it all comes down to which way the pin ball, the ping pong balls bounces to how the draw goes. But I could see them making it to the semifinals. And after that, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. I mean, do you, and do you prioritize the Thursday games that are, you know, beyond these next two 
when you know one of them, for instance, the very next round, the first leg falls on the sun on the Thursday in between uh, away to Tottenham and and home against Manchester United. I mean, do, are, as it becomes closer, the 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 fact that we're so close to the top four is almost a bit unnerving in the sense that it's so close you can't really say let's do Europa League and and settle for fifth or sixth in the Premier League because you're so close to finishing fourth. What do you what do you think if if you have to kind of prioritize one in a week like that? Where do you where do you put your priority? In my mind, I still go for the league because as you said, if there were six points out, if there were four points, they're one point out of a top four and they're competing with two teams who arguably might be even easier to surmount than the four or five we've talked about. So a lot of it for the Europa depends upon the draw. Um, I think in some ways what happens in the Spurs game will determine where the better lineup comes, be it Thursday or against United. Um, if they keep it close, if they get a draw, if they get a win, uh, there's a good chance that they'll risk the leg in the Europa and go for a stronger team on the weekend against United. If they pull a Chelsea today, um, that decision might be reversed. Yeah, uh, I, I guess you, there is some time to kind of figure out what the priority is going to be, but uh, sooner rather than later, they're going to have to figure that out. And and I don't know that we have the squad, especially with the injuries that we've had, mm -hmm. to to really fully go after both with our full. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't get both. It just means that we're you know one of them will probably have to luck into with some some uh, lesser quote unquote players on the pitch. Phil, we're going to wrap up. Thank you for joining us. It was great to have you back. Uh, let us and our users know where we can catch you on social media, on TV, radio, and on, on uh, any um, just far enough media. away, far enough away from Ainsley's Instagram account. Hopefully, um, <laughs> but yeah, I it, saw Phil underscore Shane. Yeah, yeah. it was weird. I, no. <laughs> but uh, basically, Phil Shane S C H O E N uh, Twitter. Um, I think there's a dot in there for Instagram. Uh, but you can always catch me on BN Sports uh, for the coverage. Uh, and then also Sirius XMFC. I'm going to be on Thursday and Friday this week on the football show in the morning. And even if I'm not there, there's some great guys. And you know what? Just like you guys have proved for years, if you have a chance to talk about football, it's always going to be a good day. So uh, we'd love to have you talking with us on Sirius XM. And it was a pleasure talking with you guys tonight. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Phil. And uh, you can uh, remember, if you're listening to this, you can watch us on YouTube. It is just the greatest thing ever invented. Uh, you'll never regret that. Uh, all three of us are on this week. If you are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. If you haven't already subscribed, there should shortly be a little uh, thing over my shoulder that you can click on. Um, and you can hook up uh, with any time that we go online uh, and post content. We're also on Spotify now. We are the the... the the last and final of the 97,000 Arsenal podcast to make it onto Spotify. So we figured out how to do that. <laughs> um, next week, this coming week, we, uh, we have no Premier League game over the weekend. And some of us will be uh, gallivanting around New Orleans for Gunnar Gras 6. Have you heard of uh, Phil of Gunnar Gras? Um, I don't have any beads, so I think you're on your own. <laughs> Gunnar Gras is a literally 300 Arsenal supporters all gathering in, in – uh, in New Orleans for about four days of absolute revelry. Uh, we get as far away from, from Instagram accounts and slating players as we possibly can and just enjoy the Gooner life. So, uh, so I'll be there eating pineapple pizza with Dave. I'm gonna <laughs> meet Michael for the first time. Uh, should be a good time. Um, a few people will be missing, like Andy. Uh, and we'll have to talk about what we're gonna be doing. If we, if we do, a, maybe we'll have Dave and and uh, Fredo and Joey on for a for a like an interlul type podcast, but we will sort that out and let you know. Phil, again, thanks for for joining us. Andy, always good to see you, my love. Yes, great <laughs> to see you too. Um, thank you, Phil, and uh, yeah, until until we meet again, Mike. <laughs> and now you look like you can go to sleep. Like one or two last four minutes. No, I gotta go kiss the little guy to sleep. <laughs> 
uh, that, I'm not even going to say that what 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 that's a, a euphemism for. But he, <laughs> you know he has a one and a half year old son. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With that, we will go. We will leave. Uh, good night to everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining us.